Hi, my name is Micah Long, and I'm a critical care anesthesiologist who will be talking to you today about the equipment of VV ECMO. I made this talk because I find ECMO overwhelming. The first whole bunch of times over years of seeing patients on ECMO always gave me that rush of anxiety when I walked into the room. There is simply so much there. There's lots of tubing, there's lots of monitors, there's lots of connections, and it's hard to tell what is what. The goal of today is to convince you that ECMO really, at its core, is two things. A pump and an oxygenator. Everything else is extra and does useful things, but is secondary to the primary purpose of ECMO, which is to pump blood round and round and to move oxygen in and CO2 out. That's it. And the two parts that do that are the pump and the oxygenator. I've shown the pump here. There's a whole host of pictures of two generations of pumps. This top one is the older pump, and here is how it spins. These are centrifugal. They're RPM dependent. They are not roller pumps anymore. So they are both afterload and preload sensitive. They'll spin, and they'll spin whether or not there's blood there, but you can see there they're not occlusive uh, spinning through the device, so they will not pressurize afterwards uh, if you clamp the arterial side and things like that. The RPM will spin no matter what, but the flow will change sometimes abruptly based on preload and afterload phenomenon. This is the uh, current device we use uh, at my hospital called the CardioHelp. It has an inflow, which you can see here. It runs through a rotor just like this. This and this are the same. And that rotor spins around and you can see these four out ports and those are your arterial side and those connect to the oxygenator. This is that same thing shown just a different way. We go in, the pump spins around and around and shoots it out these four sides. And you can see the back spinner here connected to the red part, which is the oxygenator portion. Um, and that's where the pump connects. Again, pumps pump the blood around and round. They're centrifugal. You turn up and down the RPM. You normally want the flow or the RPM set to be somewhere between two and 6,000, knowing that the higher you go, particularly over 4,500 or so, you'll get more heat and more cellular lysis. That's the pump. The pumps, again, are not roller, ball, roller pumps. They are uh, uh, preload sensitive. If you are hypovolemic or bleeding out, you'll have a problem, and they're sensitive to obstruction on the uh, inflow side. If you position your cannulas wrong, have tiny femoral veins, and they collapse, or if you kink the tubing or have other conditions that lower your preload, the pump will not get enough blood in. They're also afterload sensitive and therefore sensitive to high cardiac output state for VA ECMO, obstruction, like a thrombus or kink tubing, or simply severe hypertension. Normally on the systemic side with VA ECMO, which we won't talk about that much, but sometimes with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So these uh, pumps are preload and afterload sensitive. The second part of ECMO is the oxygenator. The oxygenator is probably the most technologically advanced part of ECMO itself. It is uh, cut in half here, you see on the right, and it has two series of what are really straws or tiny, tiny, tiny little tubes. One series of them connects to uh, um, a temperature exchanger where it runs warm, cold, or otherwise temperature controlled fluid through. The blood goes through that and goes through the white side here, which are a whole bunch of even more technologically advanced uh, straws that are uh, essentially countercurrent exchangers for CO2 uh, to be cleared and for O2 to diffuse into the blood. These oxygenators are technologically amazing. You want a very low resistance, high surface area for gas exchange while you minimize priming and de-air um, with low risk of air embolism, but also with this un unique goal of needing low volume and low surface area to prevent inflammatory activation or thrombus formation. So these really focus a lot on optimizing the blood flow path through the circuit itself.
Now, all of this, of course, is foreign to the patient. It activates inflammatory cascade and things of that nature, but these have advanced greatly over time and are, uh, are quite complex. Despite being quite complex in their production, the way the uh, oxygenator works is kind of straightforward. You connect the oxygenator up to blood supply that goes through it, and then you run air through those tiny little straws, and they work very similar to countercurrent exchange. What you connect to the oxygenator is called the blender, and the blender is as simple as a nasal cannula oxygen circuit. You turn on air and oxygen to a total mixture of air that's called the sweep speed. It might be two or four liters per minute, just like nasal cannula. It might be eight or 10. And then you titrate the FiO2 of that mix to help oxygen diffuse down a concentration gradient. And then as blood passes through, the CO2 is cleared and the O2 is moved into the blood. And that's it. CO2 is a very small molecule. It's uncharged and so it clears rapidly and quickly and you can clear a whole bunch of CO2, essentially as much as you want from the blood that's delivered to the ECMO circuit by adjusting the sweep. It's very quick, very rapid. The faster you turn the sweep up, the more the CO2 goes through the membrane and out the sweep. You typically start the sweep speed at about one to one or slightly above that to the amount of blood flow you have going through the pump. So for example, if you have four liters of ECMO blood flow, you'll turn the sweep speed to four liters. Oxygen is a little bit more complex. It diffuses down its concentration gradient, so it is FiO2 dependent, and it is bound by hemoglobin, so it is massively dependent on hemoglobin binding to deliver the adequate amount of oxygen. So the amount of blood flow through the ECMO circuit plus the amount of hemoglobin that is running through the ECMO circuit dictates what I call a therapeutic ceiling of delivery of oxygen by the ECMO into the blood. If you have a tiny amount of blood flow, it doesn't matter how much oxygen you give to that hemoglobin, there's simply not much blood flow going through. There's not much hemoglobin passing through. You're not delivering that much ECMO oxygen. On the flip side, you can have a lot of flow, but very, very low hemoglobin. No matter how much oxygen you give, you may improve your PaO2, as in the dissolved oxygen. That doesn't amount for much oxygen delivery you're very dependent on hemoglobin to bind that oxygen and take it up. And you can do math out to figure out how much oxygen is delivered from the ECMO by figuring out your pre and post oxygen capacities or oxygen amounts. And you multiply that by the ECMO blood flow. And that gives you your DO2 of ECMO. So that's um, uh, um, the blender and how it applies to the oxygenator. So now I hope that you can go into a room with an ECMO circuit that has all this scary stuff and realize there's two core pieces of equipment, a pump and an oxygenator. The tubes and cannulas matter, but they're extra. The monitors, computers, battery, backup power, and even the heat exchanger are all secondary to those two core functions. Now, I did say that ECMO is two parts, but this is a discussion about the equipment, so I wanna review the equipment. ECMO has a lot of monitors that help us know how the circuit's working and what's going on. There's of course patient data that is obtained non-invasively and the ECMO allows for us to draw blood from different parts like the pre and post membrane so you can get invasive data off of it. But the typical computer screens right on the ECMO support device will show some patient patient data like the SVO2, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and more. These are not always calibrated, so before you throw a, a fit and panic, make sure you ask whoever is monitoring the circuit if they're calibrated at that moment. There's flow meters that tell you how much blood flow is going through a particular part of the circuit. And finally, there's these important meters that measure pressure throughout the system. These are manometers. We look, of course, at the venous pressure. How much negative pressure does it take to pull blood from the patient to the ECMO circuit? If you're really dry, you don't have much blood there. If you're hypovolemic bleeding out, or if you have tiny, tiny little vessels, you might pull the vessel walls into the ECMO uh, cannula a little bit. All those situations are going to give you a negative pressure. Kind of like if you were to try to 
drink water through a tiny, tiny straw. <laughs> As you suck in, your cheek's gonna suck in. That negative pressure is called the suck pressure. We want it to be as low as possible, of course, but the main goals for suck pressure is to stay under 50 ideally, under 75 critically, and when you go more negative than minus 100, be very afraid that you could have a suction event where you have no blood to suck through and the cannulas stop taking in blood. We also look at a pressure gradient across the oxygenator. We want, of course, that gradient to be very close to zero. It's a low resistance circuit. As the membrane gets older, accumulates some clot, you might get some pressure gradient elevation. Anytime it doubles from a prior number matters a lot, but we absolutely want to be mindful of a transmembrane pressure over 50, which would be worrisome for a failing oxygenator. And some groups advocate for changing the oxygenator out, even if it's working okay, if that pressure gradient is over 150. And we of course check the post or arterial pressure, but we think about that a lot less, except as it applies to the transmembrane gradient. There's a lot of tubing involved in ECMO. We have big and long cannulas that go both on the venous and the arterial side. These are occlusive. They cause edema below them, um, can cause stasis of venous blood and clotting behind it, or even a decreased cerebral perfusion pressure in the neck. Arterial occlusion can cause ischemia and frequently will apply bypass cannulas to prevent ischemia. As you deliver blood from the femoral artery north to the head and the body, you want to maintain blood flow to the leg and you do bypass to succeed in that. All these plastics and tubes are foreign bodies. There's a whole world of literature and uh, product development that helps these be the most biocompatible plastics they can be. Nonetheless, all of them will activate our clotting cascade to some degree and cause a bleeding diathesis where you're prone to bleeding and to clotting and they all activate our inflammatory uh, um, pathways as well. They're coded biocompatible as much as possible, um, but they are still foreign bodies. These tubes um, can be standardized, but the smaller your tube, the less blood flow you can get. The larger your tube, the more occlusive they get. And so you want to be very thoughtful about your goals for an individual patient and optimize them accordingly. The bleeding diathesis of ECMO is unique. We're prone to iatrogenic bleeding because we have to anticoagulate to prevent clotting off of the oxygenator. But patients on ECMO also develop nonspecific coagulopathies and specific coagulopathies. Not only are they sick and critically ill and prone to problems like this, but the ECMO plastics and circuit will cause a von Willebrand deficiency over time and a platelet deficiency through interaction with the GP uh, binding uh, um, sites on platelets. There's of course inflammatory, infectious, and HIT considerations in our septic and critically ill patients on ECMO. And for all these reasons, you also get clotting. This can sometimes be iatrogenic. The patients had a GI bleed and we can't anticoagulate, but sometimes it's simply because ECMO causes a procoagulable state related to the plastics or their septic and ill otherwise. Understanding that, I really like to take ECMO and simplify it into an anatomic diagram. And now that we kind of have an understanding of the equipment involved, we can draw out this diagram. I'm simple. I draw a heart with its four chambers. And from there, I draw the vena cava and blood flow to the lungs. It's always blue, of course, because it's venous. From the lungs, Normally, we have red blood, but in a VV ECMO patient, their lungs are not working, of course. So this is all blue blood through the LV and out the aortic arch and down the femoral artery. Once I draw this out, which is the same in every patient, I add where the ECMO draws blood from, typically from the femoral vein, and what the ECMO is doing. And I may highlight the pump or the oxygenator. In the case of VV ECMO, I care a lot more about the oxygenator than I do the pump. From the ECMO circuit, we of course deliver red blood 
that goes in somewhere and I draw the arrow to where it goes into and what is supposed to be read after that point. We know, of course, that ECMO is not cardiac bypass like a cardiac bypass for a cardiac procedure in the operating room. So the ECMO blood is always going to be mixed with some amount of residual venous flow or shunt flow. This mismatch can be relevant, which I'll talk about in another talk. But from here, in general, you can oxygenate the blood enough, plus a little bit of lung function, and have good red arterial blood from here on. This anatomic setup relies on understanding that ECMO is really just a pump and an oxygenator, and understanding that it's crucial to know where you're pulling blood from and where it's going to. And that helps you simplify ECMO for when you're under pressure and, uh, and need to help somebody. That's all I have on the equipment for ECMO. I hope this helps you get a good understanding of what ECMO really is and to get an idea that ECMO is not as overwhelming as you may think from the basic understandings of the pump and the oxygenator, you can actually really make some great clinical judgments. And I'll talk through those during my next talk on VV ECMO. I hope you have a great day and that your next patient on ECMO is able to survive and thrive. Have a good day.